Praise the Lord. I want you to read with me the gospel as recorded by St. Luke chapter 1. And I want to read a portion of the prophecy of Zechariah, the father of John Baptist, beginning with verse 67 in that chapter. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. And this is one of the verses, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. I wish I had the time to go into all that is involved in these blessed words. Blessed words because they speak of something that I hope as the child of God, and if you're not a child of God, you can anticipate. And that is a deliverance or a salvation that delivers you from your enemies. Praise the Lord. And I let me just tell you of universal enemies that all mankind have. He is not talking here about our personal enemies. But all mankind face enemies. And while we like to look at some men and some women as our enemies, our Lord Jesus Christ did not come into the world to deal with human enemies. Humanity has some enemies that are much greater than human beings. I want to tell you about six of them. And you are not just bothered with them. Fact of the matter is you are tormented by them. The things that we have to think on. That were it not for Jesus, it would be too burdensome. And a man that has to think on these enemies and their work on human lives without Jesus... I can tell you now he is in a sad state. For these are enemies that no man can ignore. And enemies that are not going to let him alone. But I thank God that the text says that one of the reasons for the coming of Jesus Christ into the world was that we might be saved in verse 71. And in verse 74, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Can I get an amen here? I don't believe any Christian should have any fear while he serves God in this world. He's not ignoring anything. He's recognizing things as they are. And he is fearless, not because of who he is, but because of the promises that God has made in Jesus Christ. That we should serve him, glory to God, and not only serve him, but serve him without fear. Fear, the Bible said, hath torment. And regardless of what it is, if it torments you, if it's fearful, it will torment you. Right. I'm sure that there are things in all of our lives that we're fearful of. Praise the Lord. 
I, I, I have, there are some creatures that God made that I don't want to be around. Amen. And one in particular, I don't want to be around. And I am not only upset and disturbed, but I'm fearful and afraid of snakes. I don't want to be around where they are. And if they have to wait for me to come where they are to bite me, I'll never be bitten. For I'll never be where they are and know they're there. I've even gone in the zoo. Some years ago I was in San Diego, California, and they have a tremendous zoo in San Diego. And I asked one of the friends that was my guide that was taking me in, I said, where is the snake house? He said, right on the left hand side, going in. I said, thank you. Amen. I will not even be looking in that direction, going in. Hallelujah. And we walked in that zoo and I passed by the house. The man said, we passed it now. I said, thank you. Praise the Lord. There, there, there's a fear. There's a fear that grips me whenever I think about those creatures. And I know God had his reason for putting them here. But so far as I'm concerned, they have no place in existence so far as I'm concerned. And there's a fear because they exist. Oh, I, I, I'm talking about myself. But I can bring up a whole lot of other fears that other folk have, even where a lot of creatures are concerned. I have a deacon in this church that can't stand the mouse. Uh, and I, I was lived, I lived with a wife for many, many, many years. And she couldn't stand the worm. Just a small one. It didn't take any size, shape, or color. Just being a worm. One day I heard a scream. I was in another part of the house and I heard a blood curdling scream. Went running out to the kitchen and she was standing over in the corner. And I said, what in the world, honey, is the matter? She said, over there, over there, over there, over there. And I went over to the sink and looked and didn't see a thing. I said, I don't see. So just keep on looking. He's there. He's there. Hallelujah. I said, where? She said, take, take, uh, take the little drain out. And I took the drain out, children. And there down in the bottom of that drain was a little fella that was almost microscopic. I had to look. And when I, I said, oh, my Lord. And when I took my finger and went down there and picked him out, he was dead. And she said, he's still a worm. Dead or alive. She had her fear. And the Bible said, wherever there is fear, there is torment. Hallelujah. A little fellow was taken upstairs by his mother and put to bed. And she told him, now go to sleep. He said, but I'm afraid of the darkness. She said, go to sleep. The Lord is here with you. And he'll keep you in the darkness. And that little fellow, after so long a time, came back down the steps. His mother looked up and said, honey, I put you in bed. She said, but I want you to go up there and keep God some company. I'm afraid of the darkness. Hallelujah. And I want you to know, friend, wherever, wherever there's fear, there's torment. And men in ages past have tried to live and walk with God and serve him with a whole lot of enemies. Hallelujah. Crossing their paths and boggling their minds and troubling their hearts. But Jesus Christ came in the world to deliver us from the hand of our enemies. And I submit to you as a child of God, even though you have enemies, you you have been delivered you have been delivered you have been delivered from the hand of your enemies that you might serve God without fear all the days of your life a living holy and righteous until you die 
Hallelujah. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, listen, you have six enemies. Uh, let me call to your mind. Uh, enemy number one uh, is an enemy called sin. Uh, and I'm not talking about sin uh, by acts now. Uh, I'm talking about the nature uh, of sin uh, that's in every one uh, of our bodies. Uh, Adam gave it to us uh, and it will be there. Uh, until God gives us another body. But I have some news for you. When Jesus went to Calvary and hung out yonder, he broke the power of sin over every human life. And he let sin know, you shall not have dominion over my children. And Jesus sent you word back and whosoever the Son shall make free shall be free indeed. You don't have to walk around telling yourself, I can't help it. I can't help it. The power of sin, hallelujah, has been broken over your life. There's coming a day when you as his child can look back at the grave. And say, as you look at it, Oh, Dad, where is thy state? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Hallelujah. Where do you get it? Thanks be to God that giveth us the victory. How do you get it? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. One, one more enemy. His name is Satan. Hallelujah. If you don't know him personally, let me tell you, he's the one that's taunting you every day of your life. He's around doing something in your life every day. He is your adversary. He's the one that will deceive you if you let him. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something before I quit. You can't defeat him. You are a lost man or woman now. If you're trying to fight him and overcome him by yourself. Amen. The Bible says of Satan that he is wiser than Daniel. And Daniel was nobody's fool. But Satan wiser than Daniel. Honey, when you talk about Satan, some of us have the wrong concept. Oh, well, the devil, oh, that's, that's just a figment of the imagination. <laughs> it is. It is. I wonder where you think these folks are telling you they're hearing all these voices. Telling them to do the wrong thing. They're not hearing voices telling them to follow Jesus. They're not hearing voices telling them to obey the gospel. But hearing all kind of voices. Chop his head off. Shoot him full of holes. And they know it's not their voice. And yet I firmly believe some of them hear the voices. Evil voices. Ungodly voices. Unholy voices. Satan, that deceiver, that makes folk do wrong and think they're right. Destroy babies, dash their brains out, and say, the Lord told me. You know they've got something mixed up. Satan, that deceiver, that deceiver, and he's your enemy. He's your enemy. And if you don't walk with God, you'll never defeat him. You can't defeat him. He knows too much. He's a spirit and you are a human being. And you know very few things that happen in a spirit world. And you can't talk to him. Make the devil leave me alone. No, no. You have to have something more than that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. When Jesus met that fella in the wilderness, he did not. Have, go ahead now. Go on, Satan. Go ahead. No. That, that, that's just idle talk. You've got to have something stronger than talk. Jesus said to Satan when he presented him with a temptation, it is written. It's written. What's written? Man shall not live by bread alone. And I might say to you, there's only one thing that you can have in your life that Satan respects. And that's God's word. Satan respects God's word. You may done. But Satan, you know what your Bible told you? 
the devil believes there's one God. You know why? He found it in here. And you know the Bible said, even though he doesn't obey, he believes it and trembles. You can't even make the devil believe in a holy trinity. He knows better than that. He knows there is but one God and trembles at the fact that I got to meet one God. Those are six enemies of yours. But here's the blessed thing. That while there are universal enemies, Jesus came. Jesus came. He came in the world not for all of the beautiful that you and I see. Oh, it's, I think it's a lovely thing. <laughs> lovely thing. That this time of year, in our nation at least, things become beautiful. I'm going to tell you all something right now. And let me help you. A lot of you folk are disturbed and upset because somebody told you that if you had a Christmas tree, you'd sinned against God. Let me help you. Let me help you. Now you don't have to have a Christmas tree. But I want to tell you now, if you have one, you have not sinned against God. I just like to tell you that. Second, the scriptures that they use in your Bible doesn't have a thing to do with a Christmas tree. That's second. Out of the 10th chapter of Jeremiah, he wasn't talking about a Christmas tree. Jesus had not yet been born when Jeremiah wrote that and he was not prophesying on any Christmas tree. You don't know anybody worshiping a Christmas tree. You haven't seen nobody bowing down to a Christmas tree. You haven't had nobody look at a Christmas tree and say, oh how I love Jesus. I'm telling you, but a lot of the whole lot of them. Oh, he's afraid. He's afraid. Afraid to put up some tent. You don't have to put it up, honey. That's all right. But don't come trying to take some Bible and misuse it and misinterpret it and misplace it. Praise the Lord. Amen. I, I, I like all that's beautiful. That's connected with Jesus Christ. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I like it. I like it. Have you had a Christmas tree? Oh, yes. And if it's going to be home Christmas, but I had one in there this year. And just as saved and sanctified as I can be. Yeah, man. Yeah. Feel all right and have no condemnation. Yeah, man. That's right. That's right. But I love all the beautiful that's connected with Jesus. I love that. But I realize that beyond the beautiful and the marvelous and the magnificent, there was a cross out yonder that wasn't beautiful. He hung there. He bled there. He died there. Was taken down from there and buried and rose again. We might be delivered from the hand of our enemy that we could serve God. Serve Him without fear. Do what you want to do for God. And that's the way your Bible, that's the way Jesus even had the gospel written. Let me say this and I'm through. You ever notice when Jesus got up out of the grave and before he stepped on the wings of the wind and went back to his throne? St. Matthew records that his words were all hell, all hate, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. You ever notice the next thing he says? Go into all the world, teach all nations. You ever notice something? He didn't tell him to ask anybody. They now go, go ask the Romans if you can teach. 
Go ask the Greeks if you can teach. He took 12 men, 11 men, and them going all over. Preach the gospel. Where were they getting their authority from? From the deliverer. The heavens and the earth belong to him. And he had the right to tell them to go. And that's what he did. Go, go, go. Preach the gospel every creature. Anybody believe that gospel and get baptized? I'll see. That we being delivered. Oh, that, that rings in our soul. That we being delivered from the hand of our enemy might serve him without fear. In righteousness. I like that too. You live in an unrighteous world, honey. They don't believe in too much righteousness. But you can serve him in righteousness. You can serve him in holiness. How long? How long? And you can do it without fear. God bless you. And if you're here tonight, if you're here, without his marvelous salvation. If you're here, and the only reason your life isn't changed is because of your faith.